The following message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. This morning, if you'll take your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12. Matthew, chapter 12. Our reading will be from verse number 22 to verse number 37. And as I read these words, if you would follow along with your eyes, Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse number 22. The Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods? except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. For whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of of the hut, bringeth forth good things, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned." As you probably noticed here, this passage of scripture records for us a confrontation between the Lord Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. The Pharisees in his day were the religious crowd, the ones who felt that they had a corner on faith and what men should believe. And of course, they were in the most part lost men who had no personal relationship with God. They were legalists just applying rules and regulations and being very, very judgmental. Here the Lord Jesus Christ has just healed a blind, mute man. And that in itself is a demonstration of his great power. The people, they reacted in verse number 23. They were amazed. There was a recognition of who Jesus is. But the Pharisees in verse 24, their reaction to this miracle was a rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's really interesting just in thinking about those two reactions, how our attitude in life is really dependent upon how we see the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've lost your joy, it's because you've lost the, I think, sight of what Jesus Christ has done for you. These people, they saw a great miracle and they rejoiced and gave praise to God and it changed their life. But on the other hand, you have people who see the same working of God. They see the same miracle, but because of their attitude, they condemn our Savior. And really, we have the same two reactions that take place even today. People are either for Christ or they're against him. In fact, Jesus said that. You'll notice in verse number 30, he that is not with me is against me. 
And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Today you are on one side of the fence or the other. You're either with Christ or you're against him. And of course we understand that in the realm of salvation, that uh, you're either saved or you're lost. But I think sometimes even as Christians we can apply that thought that we're either living for Christ or we're not. And our attitude will show it. Our demeanor will often show it. But notice that there is no middle ground with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either for him or against him. You're either saved or you're separated from God or you are seeking the Lord. I think those are the only three options that we have today and I hope that you are saved and if you're not saved that you're seeking. You want to know what it is to be saved. Now this morning I want to direct your attention in particular to verse 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now in these two verses of Scripture... First of all, you notice a wonderful promise from God, a wonderful, a wonderful statement here in verse 31 where Jesus said, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Rejoice in that statement, all manner of sin. In other words, it doesn't matter what sins you may have personally committed. It's not, it doesn't matter what, uh, how bad a sinner you consider yourself to be or how great your sin may have been. Jesus said all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. And he has the power on earth to forgive sins. So there is a wonderful message of salvation here. We sing it in a song, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5, And verse number 20, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we praise God today for the wonderful promise of salvation that regardless of whether we consider ourselves or others would consider us as a little sinner or a great sinner, and we read of both in the Bible, that all manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven unto men. Jesus Christ can forgive you and save you. You are in his love and he's able to do that we need to have confidence in that that very truth and so first of all we see this wonderful promise from God but then the remaining part of the two verses that I want us to think about today we see that there is a very solemn warning that is given because Jesus went on to say but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men And in the latter part of verse 32, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And this morning I want to speak on those, that thought there of what is sometimes referred to as the unpardonable sin. It's a thought that has troubled many, many people down through the years. People are concerned about whether they have committed the unpardonable sin and therefore are left in a hopeless state. There is no hope for me. You don't understand what I have done uh, is totally unforgivable. Well, we'll see. We'll see what the Bible does have to say about that. Some people are concerned that they have somehow sinned away the day of grace and that there's no further opportunities for them to be saved. There are people today who would misuse this verse against those who would point out from the scriptures that so-called speaking in tongues is uh, not for today and even uh, what is practiced today is not what the Bible teaches anyway. People say, well, you better be careful criticizing us because you're criticizing the work of the Holy Spirit and you could be committing the unpardonable sin. So there's a lot of confusion about this and I want really to try to teach you today from God's word as to exactly what this unpardonable sin or this unforgivable sin really is all about. Before we get into that, I want to just give some background, some 
theological background that will help us to understand a couple of things. First of all, concerning the Holy Ghost. You notice twice here, Jesus talks about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and in verse 32, speaking against the Holy Ghost. Now when the Bible uses that term, and by the way, as you read through scripture, you'll find that sometimes he is referred to as the Holy Ghost and sometimes as the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Well, in this way, that when the Bible speaks of him as the Spirit, it is really speaking or highlighting his essence, that he is a spirit, meaning that he has, he's uh, what we would say, immaterial. There is no fleshly body to the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not real just because he cannot be seen. The Bible says that God is a spirit. And so when the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit, it's reminding us that he is a spirit being. When the Bible uses the word ghost, it's highlighting the fact that he is a person. He is a person. That he's not just an it. Some people refer to the Holy Spirit as an it, meaning an impersonal force. There are cults today who would teach that the the Spirit of God is just the power of God. It's a name for the power of God and, and it's like some unseen force some uh, perhaps akin to a magnetic force or, or to gravity, and it's a divine force, but the Holy Spirit himself is not a person. Well, the Bible begs to differ. The Holy Spirit is not an it, he's a personal, he's a person. Uh, for example, if you turn over in your Bibles to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, we see that many times over, In speaking about the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ uses personal pronouns. John chapter 14, uh, looking at verse number 16 and 17, for example. Here the Lord is giving the promise that he will go back to heaven and he will send the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another Comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. You'll notice there the use of the words him and he. And then if you look over in the 16th chapter and verse number seven and eight, Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you a truth that is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then you look down to verse 13 again. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine. And I think it's uh, pretty obvious here that the Lord Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost as a person. And as we read about him in the Bible, we see that he acts like a person. We see where the Holy Spirit speaks. We see that the Holy Spirit knows that the Holy Spirit wills, he commands, he forbids, he calls. All of these are the attributes of a personal being. And so when Jesus speaks about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, you know, it's impossible to blaspheme an impersonal force. If I look at this pulpit, this pulpit is a piece of dead wood. I could stand here and blaspheme and curse this pulpit and I don't affect it in any way because... It has no life. It's not a person. So these things that we read about here of blasphemy blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and and speaking against the Holy Ghost are acts that you would direct towards someone, not an it. R.A. Torrey said that if we think of the Holy Spirit as an it, then our chief concern is going to be how can I get hold of it and use it for my purposes? And that's a big mistake today that people are seeking 
to get a hold of the Spirit of God in a way that would benefit them, whereas the Bible always speaks about him having us, that he wants to get a hold of us and use us for God's glory. Now we know the scripture teaches that each true believer is indwelt by the Spirit of God. That's part of the miracle of salvation. You know, people say, well, if I get saved, how am I going to give up all these sinful things that I'm doing? I I just can't do that. Well, that's true. You can't do it. That's why you need Christ. And when you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit of God who indwells us. It's the miracle of salvation. When we receive Jesus Christ, when we believe on him, we receive the gift of the Spirit of God. And he takes up residence in our life. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible describes this wonderful miracle. It says that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. This is verse 13 now. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. I mean, those verses of scripture tell us a wonderful truth that when you get saved, you don't go straight to heaven. Heaven, we preached on that a couple of weeks ago, the glories of heaven, unspeakable. That's what's reserved for you and me in heaven. But right now we're down here on this earth, so God just gives us a down payment, and that is the presence, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to be overcomers, and God will give us victory over those sinful habits and those things in our life that are displeasing to God. It's not a matter of getting saved and then having to do it yourself. God provides the Spirit of God within. And it's a permanent indwelling, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14. Beloved, if you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, then you have all of the Spirit than anyone could ever have. And the reason is because he's a person. God doesn't parcel himself out piecemeal. You can't say, well, I have less of the Spirit than this brother or this sister. If you're saved, you've received all of the Holy Spirit. And uh, when you receive Christ, likewise, you didn't receive half of Christ or a part of Christ. And it is the Spirit of God who dwells within us, who mediates the presence of Jesus Christ in our spirit. This is his wonderful work. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. God gives us that assurance. The spirit of God takes the word of truth, the word of God, and bears witness through the word of God that we are the children of God. You know that you're saved. You don't have to hope it. You don't have to think, well, maybe, possibly. You can know because the indwelling spirit of God is present there all of the time. And as you read the scriptures, he speaks to us and confirms that wonderful understanding. So when Jesus speaks here about the Holy Ghost, he's talking about a person that we receive at the moment of salvation. So what about the sins against the Holy Ghost that Jesus is speaking of? You know, in the New Testament, there are four sins that can be committed against the Holy Spirit. First of all, according to Acts chapter 7, verse 51, you can resist the Holy Ghost. You can resist the Holy Ghost. That's a sin against salvation. When you hear how to be saved from the Bible, you are brought to a point of decision. Will you accept the word of God? Will you receive Jesus Christ or will you reject him? When you decide not today, not now, maybe later, or no, I don't want anything to do with this, you are resisting because it's the work of the Spirit of God who brings that conviction into our hearts. It's resisting that conviction. Stephen said, why do you resist the Holy Ghost? You can resist him. I hope that you would not do that today. 
Then the Bible speaks about blaspheming the Holy Ghost, which is a sin against spiritual sensitivity. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30, the Bible talks about grieving the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, which is a sin against sanctification. It's a sin where a Christian allows self to reign instead of allowing the Spirit of God to control our life. And you, once you do that, all of these things such as anger and blasphemy and, and, and uh, malice and these things come out of our life because they're the works of the flesh. And by the way, that would include lying to the Holy Ghost, the example of which we see with Ananias and Sapphira there in the church. And then the fourth sin against the Spirit of God is quenching the Spirit, which is a sin against service. You know, quenching the, the Spirit according to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19, is when you throw, as we use the expression, throwing a wet blanket on the work of God's spirit. When God begins to speak to you through the preaching of God's word or just through the reading of God's word and God is showing you things and you realize in your heart, I need to make some changes, but I'm not going to do that. Or when the spirit of God is calling you to do something, to be something for Christ and you resist that call and you you just throw cold water on the whole thing. I don't want to get excited here. That's called quenching the spirit. Now the first two of these sins that I've mentioned, that of resisting the Holy Ghost and blaspheming the Holy Ghost, those are sins that can only be committed by a lost person. The last two grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Spirit can only be committed by a saved person. But the fact that they are sins against the Holy Spirit show us that he is a person. You you can't grieve an inanimate object. I can't say to this pulpit, you're the most ugly looking pulpit I've ever seen. And the pulpit would melt in a fit of tears and sorrow. I mean, it's just going to stand there. It's not an ugly pulpit, by the way, but, and if I did offend you, I'm sorry. I can't quench an inanimate object, but you can do that to a person. And I bring that out because Jesus here is talking about affecting the Holy Spirit in a personal way. He said, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost... It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So that brings me to the point of the message. What is this unpardonable or unforgivable sin? Well, the Bible defines it here very clearly as speaking against the Holy Ghost. So what does that mean? What does it mean to speak against the Holy Ghost? Well, you have to look at the context here and you'll see that the Lord Jesus had done a great miracle. He had cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Uh, In verse number 28, that's what he said. Uh, He said, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. So in his ministry, as Jesus went about doing these miracles, it was by the Spirit of God. Now the Pharisees were saying, oh, it's by the Spirit of the devil. That's what it means to speak against the Holy Ghost. Jesus cast out these devils and Of course, these miracles that he did were to prove or demonstrate a point. Jesus himself said in John 5 and verse 36, the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. You know, Jesus did not heal every sick person. Jesus did not cause every dumb person to speak or every blind person to see. He was selective, but the purpose of these miracles was to demonstrate that he was the Son of God and therefore he is able and capable and qualified to be our Saviour. Jesus is known for his miracles. There are about 40 of them described specifically in the New Testament and over 70% of those miracles did involve healing or deliverance. And what do they do? They prove to us, even today, that the way of salvation is open. Notice again in verse number 28 there of our chapter, in chapter 12, 
He said, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, notice the next part, then is the kingdom of God come unto you. Now the kingdom of God is salvation. You know, Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God without being born again. And Jesus is saying, I do these miracles because I want you to know the kingdom of God, the way into that kingdom is open. And I am the door. If you want to get into the kingdom of God and be saved, you come through me. That was the message of the miracle. But the Pharisees rejected that. The Pharisees said, oh, he cast them out by the power of of the devil. In verse 24, we see that as they rejected what God was doing and what the Spirit of God was doing. So really, the unpardonable sin, if we can define it very simply, is to reject the work of the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ. It's to reject what God is doing. It, It means to reject the gospel. Even when Peter was preaching to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, I want you to see part of his message here in, as he was preaching to Cornelius and, and the men that were there with him. In Acts 10 and verse 36, he was talking about the, the gospel. He said, that word which God sent under the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word, I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. And then in verse 38, he he said this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree But God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Even Peter in his preaching of the fact that Jesus died for our sins and and was buried and rose again, he said that Jesus went about doing good with these miracles to show us that he is the way of salvation. He is the way of salvation. And so to reject what the Spirit of God is doing is to reject the only cure for our sins and the wages of sin. I often use the illustration to explain this, that if you went to a doctor and you said, you know, doctor, I, I've got this terrible pain and, and something's wrong inside my body, can you help me? And the doctor performs the necessary tests and he sends you off for x-rays and all kinds of things that they do today and the And the diagnosis comes back and says, you have a disease that's incurable. It's going to take your life. There is only one way to prevent that. It's with this big horse pill. And if you'll take that every day, one pill a day, you'll live on. And you say, well, you know, I don't like the shape of that pill. So I'm not going to take it. Or I can't get that size of a pill down my my throat, uh, or I just don't like the taste of it. We can come up with all kinds of reasons and we can say, I know that this will save my life, but I'm rejecting that. Then what hope is there? And I'll tell you, according to the Bible, Jesus Christ is the only hope of salvation. Contrary to popular belief, there's only one way to be saved. Now, I know we live in a world where people say, well, you know, you have your way and As long as you're sincere and you live a good life, you can be saved. That's a lie of the devil, I believe, designed to keep you from getting saved and to send you to hell. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the the way. He didn't say, I'm a way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's very, very exclusive. There's only one way to be saved. You have to come through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter preached in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, we read, neither is there salvation in any other. You can't get saved by being a good uh, Islamist. You can't be saved by being a good Hindu or a good Buddhist or a good Catholic or a good anything. And by the way, you can't be saved by being a good Baptist. 
You have to be saved by being a repentant sinner coming to God through Jesus Christ. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other plan. You know, people say, well, I don't like what you preach. It's, it's too hard-nosed and, you know, it just makes me feel bad. Well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to do that, but I'm just giving you what Jesus has said. And I want you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, because I'm sorry to tell you there, there is no plan B. There is no supermarket religion here where you can look at the different products and say, you know, I much prefer this way to get to God. <laughs> I guess it would be nice if we could, but that's not how it works. In fact, I want you to see in Hebrews 10, verse 26 and 27, the Bible says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now it says, If we sin willfully, not ignorantly, but willfully, we decide, you know what? I, I've received the knowledge of the truth. You've told me how to be saved. You've shown me the way to God through Jesus Christ. I understand the gospel. I've received the knowledge of the truth, but it's not for me. Then you're sinning willfully. And the Bible says there remaineth no more sacrifice. You can't run down to some other religious group and say, well, let me, let me get saved your way. There is only one way. And there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Nobody else died for you. Only Jesus Christ in his perfect sinless body and life died and took your sins and paid the penalty for your sins. No one else has done that for you. And not only that, but no one else has ever risen from the dead to show you that there's life abundant through me. Only our Savior. And when you reject him, there is no cure. It's like going back to the doctor and saying, Doc, this, this pain is getting worse. And I feel like my days are numbered. I'm going to die real soon. And the doc says, well, did you take those horse pills I gave you? Oh, no, I didn't want those. What can the doctor do? except shake his head and write the bill. That's about it. So simply put, the unpardonable or the unforgivable sin is to reject Jesus Christ. And notice that Jesus said it's not just now, but it stands for eternity. In Matthew chapter 12, again, the latter part of verse 32, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, but then it says neither in the world to come. And it is possible for you to continually reject the gospel of Jesus Christ to the point where there is, no, there is nothing left. And maybe God will, the Spirit of God will not knock on your heart anymore. And, and, and there will be no chances uh, or opportunities, I should say, for you to be saved. The last thing I want to talk about is simply a question that people sometimes ask. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I, have I done this? Well, as I've already said, it's a sin that can only be committed by a lost man or a woman. And only you and God know for sure if you're truly born again. Let me say that salvation is an event. It's not a process. You may not have a date when you were saved, but you certainly should have a memory of when you were saved. You know, some people, Brother Ferris is really good at this, he can't remember when he got married. But every morning he wakes up, he says, I know I'm married. <laughs> well, when salvation is, I mean, some people say, if you don't have a date written down in your Bible, then you can't be saved. No, I don't believe that's true. But you can remember when you got saved. And most of you probably can remember when you got saved like it was yesterday. You don't have to think you were. You don't need somebody to tell you that you were. You should know. Salvation is an event. It's like a birthday. You're born again. You have a day of salvation. A point when you saw yourself as a sinner and you saw, yourself, saw Jesus Christ as your saviour 
and you turned from sin and self and received him as your personal Lord and Saviour. If you've done that, then you can't commit the unpardonable sin. And the fact that you're asking the question, have I committed this sin, shows that you're not there yet if you, if you aren't saved. But there is a line that can be crossed, I believe that, when there'll be no further working of the Holy Spirit. And I'm certainly not qualified or able to say to you where that line is for you. But there is a line of decision. Back in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 38 and 39, the Bible speaks about this line of decision. The Bible says, Now the just, or the saved, shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. See, God's not going to force you to cross that line and be saved or believe on Jesus Christ. You have a personal decision to make either to accept Christ or to reject him. And if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39, speaking to Christians, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who believe unto the say or to the saving of the soul. So once again, we see that it all comes down to he that is not with me is against me. You're either a saved person or you're a lost person. And... Today you can do something about that. But here's the danger. The pathway to committing this unpardonable sin begins with resisting the Spirit of God. So many times we preach the gospel from this pulpit and there are people in the congregation who have never been saved. We're glad that they're here and we, we love them and, and we want them to hear the message, but so many times... They even experience, you can tell by talking, that they're experiencing the conviction of the Holy Ghost. God is speaking to them and, and there's that prompting, you need to be saved, you, your sins are many and they're holding uh, you away from God. You need to have Jesus as your saviour. That's conviction, that's the work of God. And instead of responding, they reject it. And when you reject the gospel, you start establishing a direction and a momentum toward the unpardonable sin. Each rejection gets a little easier and before long it's, it's just not even there. Do you know that the only time that God offers to save you is now? There's no place in the Bible that says come back next week, come back in a year. The only time that God says you need to be saved is now. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, now this is the preacher speaking, we then, as workers together with him, beseech or beg you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. If God is speaking to you and you know it, now's the time to deal with that. Not to, not to say, well, God spoke to me and, yeah, I'm glad he spoke to me, but not today, not, not now. You know, when S Stephen preached that great message that's recorded in Acts chapter 7, the Bible says the, the hearers were cut to the heart. I mean, they were, they were just standing there totally guilty before God. But instead of turning to Christ, they killed the preacher. That's pretty extreme. We don't do that often today, thankfully, but let me say that even a casual procrastination is Satan's chloroform. Slowly causing an immunity to the Spirit's convicting, converting work. That's the danger. Each rejection of the gospel, no matter how polite it may be, just brings you that one step closer to committing this unforgivable sin of totally rejecting the cure for your sins. You know, the thought of committing this kind of sin is certainly not pleasant, and I understand that it would cut across the popular unbiblical notion 
that God loves us so much that he'll just overlook sin. How often do we hear that today? Well, there is a positive message and I, I want to certainly end on a positive note and I draw your attention back to verse 31, that first part of that verse where Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. You see, that's the good news. Yes, you can reject that and eventually you'll die and go out into a Christless eternity. But until that time or until you cross that line, Jesus Christ is saying, I know what you've done. I know who you are. And I died for you and I died for those sins and I paid that all in full. I'm just inviting you to receive me as saviour today. And that's a great message. Whether you're guilty of the sins of the flesh that are open for all to see or whether you're guilty of attitude sins such as pride that is unseen by most people. All manner of sins, all, can be forgiven forgotten and washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Do you need to be saved today? Then listen to the voice of God. What God says, taken from the book of Isaiah. The Lord says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. If that's you today, I invite you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The preceding message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. You can find additional information about the church and our publications ministry on the web at bbcoakharbor.org. For further assistance with specific questions, please feel free to give us a call at area code 360-675-8311. Thank you for listening. Our prayer is that you received a blessing from the preaching of God's word.